Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you, youth choir. How many is evident? It's just evident to us all the momentum that is in our church right now. A revival atmosphere. We know God is moving. Somebody say praise the Lord. I want you just to lift your hands. Let's magnify him and give him praise this morning for who he is. Let's lift him up. Hallelujah. We praise your holy name today, God. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for what you're going to continue to do. We are expecting your great move, God. Hallelujah. Would you put your hands together? Give God a praise with your hands. say praise the Lord. Ushers are preparing. We want to remind you of your tithe and offering this morning. Please be faithful in your giving. Ushers, if you'll come quickly. Somebody say praise the Lord. Somebody say I got the victory. Come on, I can't hear you. Somebody say I got the victory. Amen. We're going to pray now for the offering. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity to give. Thank you for every gift, every giver. We pray in abundance that you would bring into this storehouse and let the church say amen. God bless you as you give. children that love quizzing, Bible quizzing is of God. Amen. And so they had a quiz. I want you to tell where it was and what happened. What was the results? And I want to really know if you beat somebody. So we got fourth place. I'm in Bellflower. Our first quiz, we beat Bellflower one. Say that again. We beat Bellflower one. Who's Bellflower won? <laughs> I don't know. They were the champs last year. They were the champs last year. And then our second quiz we lost. And then in the losers tournament we beat Word of Flame. Yeah. And then in the 
Second losers tournament quiz we beat, I mean, we lost to Bell, I mean, the Gateway. We lost the Gateway. I just wanted you to tell everybody you beat the champs from last year. Way to go. Amen. You can't lose in Bible quizzing. You can't lose. You might lose, but you can't lose. Because it's all about learning the Word of God, memorizing God's Word. I want to reiterate again, if she didn't hear it, Sister Gill, we love you and appreciate you. This church operates because of Sister Gill. It's built on Sister Gills over the years that make this church go. They've always been there. They've always worked. They've always labored. They've always been faithful. She's over there sitting down by that window. Give her a hand, Sister Gill. Amen. Welcome, everybody. Uh, the more I look, the more I see precious people that are here visiting today. A Mulder family, God bless them from... Uh, Nevada, we got folks here today from Texas, we got folks from all kinds of ports, and I don't know everybody's name and all of your life story, but God brought you here and we're excited you're here. Amen, amen, amen. Met a young man back here from Texas that helped do the burial for Sister Kilgore, John Kilgore and Tigger Kilgore, some of the great people of all time in the kingdom. And they grew up in Jerusalem with the Urshan brothers in, uh, in a very tough time. And we appreciate so much their ministry over the years. If you ever got to a camp meeting and heard John Kershaw, you never forgot it. And you never forgot. I think he preached a few deeper lives right here. Praise God. It would always say, my God, my God in heaven. Praise God. I'm going to invite you to my favorite book in the Bible, the book of James, chapter 1. Amen. Wonderful to have the Galonies with us today. And I know that I'm trying to tie up loose ends. I might forget somebody, but I'm not trying to. Amen. I only got two eyes, and they work half the time. Praise God. I want to preach today on the blessing of divine order. The blessing of divine order. You will have a rotten marriage without divine order. You will have a lousy family without divine order. You will not have revival in a church without divine order. In fact, all of the equations of relationships in life are built around what God called divine order. So let's learn today from the Word of God I wanted to preach evangelistically and sort of do a tune-up for the Philippines, but God wouldn't let me. I'm preaching pastorally. I'm getting ready to leave. The cat's away. The mouse will play. I hope not. I hope the mouse will pray. Praise God. Amen. And, and Brother Simmons is in charge. That means call Brother Simmons. He's in charge. He's making the decisions. And we're wonderful, uh, thrilled, honored to have Brother and Sister Bernard Elms. I told him... While I'm gone, get up here and sit down up here and, and, and help us out. And he's on call with Brother, with Brother Simmons. This chair right here, this is not Pastor Larson's throne. It's got no special equation to it. It was bought by Fred Radislaw. It's a wonderful chair. Anybody can sit in it. Bernard Elms can sit in that chair and nobody look at him and go, Oh my God, he's sitting in the holy chair. It's, it's, it's just a chair. Hallelujah. In fact, I, I sit, sit more times behind it in that chair because of the lumbar support I get out of the other chair. So it's not, the, I didn't see a vision of an angel back in the second chair. That's what, there's nothing to do with that. Praise God. So everybody stay cool, cool heads. Hallelujah. James chapter 1, verse 21. I'm going to read through the 24th verse and then from 1 John 2. Now please... Note what the scripture says. Wherefore lay apart, this 21st verse of James 1, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. Look at those words. Superfluity. That means being naughty like Superman bad. And receive with meekness, that means no anger, 
I'm not angry. I'm going to pastor today, and I'm not angry. I love everybody. I'm going to set the table straight right now. I love everybody. I have no remorse towards anyone. But the word of God, it'll cut deep. It's a sword. I'm delivering a weapon. I'm going to read it again because it's so powerful. And superfluity of naughtiness. And receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul. Now we're talking. That's why we're here. Verse 22, it says, but, amen. Remember Johnny James preaching this pulpit? I'll never forget it. He said, you got to watch out for the buts. But, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Don't let that just floss over your brain. Be ye doers, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Wow, that's important. For if any be a, a hearer, if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. And I didn't know Sister Larson was preaching about reflections today, and here it is. This, this is what God gave me. Uh, uh, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass, for he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. 1 John 2 and 15 and 16. In your hearing, 1 John 2. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Everybody got it? Is it truth? If any man love the world, the love of the Father, preach all you want about how good you are, but this is what the Bible says. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God, divine order. He that doeth the will of God abideth forever. The blessing of divine order. Amen. Mark, Cherie, St. Augustine, love you much. Saw them in the restaurant. Good to see you this morning. Give them a hand today. Praise God. Presbyter, pray over the word. God, we thank you for the divine word of God. Lord, I pray today your blessing, your anointing upon the speaker and also the hearers of the word today. Let our hearts be changed and empowered and drawn closer to you by this message this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Clap your hands, clap your hands, all ye people, clap your hands. Wonderful choir, wonderful music, wonderful youth choir. I tried to get out front and stop them and sing it again, but I was too late. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you. I want you to hear me. I deeply, deeply appreciate all of you that are here this morning and committed to church. Thank you for coming to open your heart and hear the word of the Lord. I am a blessed man to pastor one of the great churches in the country because you are great people of God and you love the Lord and you're a joy to pastor. The Bible says in this beginning of looking at the blessing of divine order, does anybody here want to know what divine order is? Do you want, you want to find that out? Well, we're going to look at it, it and I'd like to say from Psalm 19, it says in the seventh verse that the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right. Amen. So notice testimony, statutes. Look at this. Rejoicing in the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure. Everybody say commandment. Brother Galoni was a seal. And that's, that's b -b 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 bad to the bone. Uh, there's not many seals. 
unless you go to La Jolla Cove. Hallelujah. And Brother Galoni's probably the only guy that could have swam to church today from Imperial Beach. And I told him that, and he said, and back. Praise God. I liked it. I liked it. That's that Semper Fi. That's that. Hoo-ya! Praise God. I like that. That came right out of him. And it says here, the commandment of the Lord is pure. Why wouldn't you want something like that? And it is enlightening to the eyes. I want my eyes enlightened today. And the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey of the honeycomb. The blessing of divine order, praise God. We are to embrace, we are to apply, we are to believe, we are to receive what God shows us in divine order. Now can anybody argue with me this morning can you actually stand up and argue with me this morning and tell me that God is not a God of order? Does everybody believe God's a God of order? Yeah. Amen. And you go to court, order in the court. What, what would the military be without, you know, about face? You know, what would it be if they didn't learn how to march in cadence and, and, and submit to authority? But you look at God in, in order, just notice outer space, just Look through a telescope, the cosmos, notice the seasons, notice the calendar and how it works in A.D. and B.C. Notice the 24-hour clock that we live by and the sun in San Diego coming through that western wall or the southern wall and how God uses the suns and the tides. And then there's seed time and harvest. It's amazing order of God. And then there's the planet alignment and and God creates order until this book says, enter sin. And in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve and Lucifer, the new result of sin is disorder. Notice everybody in the Garden of Eden, a paradise was kicked out. And the animals began to consume each other. It, it threw the world into havoc when it got out of divine order. Hallelujah. Let me introduce you to a lady called um, One Bite Eve. Praise God. I don't know if you've ever heard of One Bite Eve, but the Bible says that God made everything for man to bless man. Everything in the Garden of Eden, you all believe God's a good God? Everything was to bless. Everything was to anoint. There was only one thing. There wasn't 10 commandments. There wasn't 365 books. There was one solitary rule. One, 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 one. God is oneness. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that you do, you shall surely die. And the Bible says you're going to die if you get out of the order. And the Bible lets us know that the woman, Adam, took the chicken way out. He said, God, the woman that you gave me, she got me to eat the fruit. I don't know what it was. Everybody uses the apple thing, so we could stay with that. But I want you to know, God told Adam, not Eve, to watch over the garden, to take care of the garden, to respect his word, to not eat of that tree. And Eve went over, you know, delightful, sweet. It was Valentine's Day. Uh, I, I don't know what Eve looked like, but, but Eve was probably real pretty. She's the first person... That was female in history, and he was the first male. I mean, they were flawless. They came right from God's hand. And so she says to Adam, you need to take a bite. One bite, Eve said that. And he goes, why? She said, because, you know, we got all this stuff that we're supposed to enjoy, but it's bugging me. We can't have that. God's sort of a mean God. We can't have that one thing. And you know what that snake told me? That snake over there said, the reason he won't let you eat it is because on the day that you do, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God. 
so he don't want you to have it. Now, folks, I want to tell you something. The devil got man in the garden that way the first time. He's still doing it the exact same way. He still is deceiving people, and deception breeds deception, and the deception of deception is deception. And it, it's, it's a terrible, terrible wheel that goes around. So old Eve, one bite Eve, she goes over. She takes the fruit. She walks over to Adam, and she says, I got it. Here, eat. She didn't want to eat it. She gave it to Adam. He ate it. They both ate it then. And their eyes were open. The Bible says, though, that they, they, they could not understand and conceive that the day that you do this, you will surely die. Why? Because you've got out of the blessing of divine order. Everybody got kicked out. Man now has to work by the sweat of his brow. Anybody work this week? Well, thank God. Thank God you work. Thank God you got a job. And if you don't work, then go watch the anthill. Praise God. We've got to work by the sweat of our brow. And women, because of Eve plucking the apple, have babies in a lot of sorrow. They say that the closest a woman ever gets to death without dying is the day that she gives birth to a baby. And that is quite a situation. So let's just spill the beans this morning right up front. First of all, what is divine order? According to 1 Kings chapter 17, I'm very dry, I'm sorry. 1 Kings chapter 17, the Lord began to deal with the enemies of Israel. And he used a man by the name of Elijah. And he said, Elijah, I want you to do this and this. You're going to chastise the enemies of God for their sin. And then he gave this man of God, Elijah, the revelation of true divine order. Now, divine order, first of all, I'm going to lose everybody on the next statement, and you're going to head for Denny's. This, this next statement. The first thing that comes through divine order is a command. Hallelujah. They have commands in the military? Well, there's commands in the church. Preach the word, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Long suffering. But it's a command. When you say the word command in 2018, you have lost half the young people. This is the generation that wants everything free and they don't want to hear anything about obey or a command. But folks, it is so critically important. This is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Commands are required by God, not man. God. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah and said, okay, what's the command? Take thee and go and stay at the brook Cherith. That was the command. Get out of the Motel 6. Get out of your bed. Get out of where you're at. Go to the brook Cherith. That's the command. Why? Because, note, with the command, you're going to have survival. You're going to live. You're going to have food. You're going to have health. You're going to have shade. You're going to have life. You're going to have a future. All of that was in a command. I will provide for you if... You go to the brook Cherith. Is that such a bad command? I will keep you safe if you go to the brook Cherith. So God commands as a necessity to give us hope and to give us safety. Clap your hands to the Lord for that. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. So he goes down to the brook Cherith and he starts looking around at his new quarters and it's, it's nice, cool water. It's a brook. It's clean. He's got a bath. And uh, he says, the Lord says to him, because you've come to the brook Cherith, I have ordered a special uh, taco truck. And they're pulling up right now. It's called the birds. Praise God. Here come the ravens. And they're bringing double cheeseburgers. And they're taking care of the man of God. And they're feeding him. Now look at divine order. I want you to see it. Some of you going on your morning nap. God bless you. Sleep well. I see you. But I want you to know that the Bible says God commanded first. 
God promised second. And God did it work, did what he said, thirdly. It's command, it's promise, hallelujah, and then it's God doing his thing. Say praise the Lord. Elijah had the groceries, the shower, the bath, the birds, the food, the morning meal, the evening meal, all because of divine order. Command, promise, and God's performance. Command, promise, and God's performance. That's how he does it. That's our God. That's his way. But what's the key here? Between promise and between performance is a word called compliance. I was amazed Sister Larson used the word compliance this morning when she was teaching. She says, uh, I, I looked that word up yesterday. I'm using that word today. I didn't get it from her. She didn't get it from me, but I thought that's amazing. She used that. And the prophet Elijah did as the Lord commanded him to do. When all of the obedience was done on the command, then the promises came forward and God performed for the man of God. And, and that's why I read in the text, the Bible says, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Hallelujah. The full performance of God's promise is wrapped up in our cooperation. It's wrapped up in our doing. Hallelujah. Not being deceived. If there's no compliance in your life, you're deceived. I got three amens. The word compliance means the action of you complying with a wish or command. The action of you or I complying with a wish or a command. The act of conforming to a mold. The tendency to yield or acquiesce in spirit. Divine order, command of God, promise of God, performance of God, and sandwiched between the miracle is obedience unto God. So here is the issue. If we all do what God tells us to do, we all experience what God promised he said he would do. If you do what God says, you get what God promised. Say praise the Lord. It's simple, but it's profound. It's divine order. And Psalm 19 says in keeping God's command, there is a great reward, it says, not in believing it, not in quoting it, not in memorizing it, Brian, but in doing it. In the doing of his word, it brings the performance of God. Hallelujah. Israel was given by God ten commandments to live their lives by. And the Bible shows us clearly that their wonderful commandments, they were for the blessing of the nation. They were for the preservation of the nation. They were for the fulfillment of the nation, for meeting the needs of the nation, to be a holy nation, a peculiar people, hauled out of darkness in the marvelous light. And the Bible lets us know that when Israel obeyed the commandments of God, all went well. All went well. When they broke the commandments, the promise stopped. The promise stopped. Now, we serve a God today that loves to perform. He loves to show his ways. He loves to bring his blessings. I'm telling you today, God wants to bless everybody in the sound of my voice. He wants to bless you and keep you and anoint you and use you and touch you. But it is not enough to just go to church. Where are you going Sunday morning? I'm going to church. What are you doing there? I'm going to church. What for? Sit. I'm going to church. I'm parking in the same spot. I'm going to walk in. I'm going to sit. That's what I do. I go to church. God bless you. That's just wonderful. I'm glad you come. I'm glad you take up a parking spot. I'm glad that you helped put a dollar in and pay the electrical bill. But bless God, going to church is not where the blessing's at. The divine order is I will enter his gates with thanksgiving. I will enter his courts with praise. 
I will worship the name of the Lord with all of my heart, all of my soul, all of my mind, all of my strength. Don't just go to church. Help make the church go. Get with it. Add something. Bring something. Hallelujah. Be something. Impact. Serve. Love. Now, is that ugly preaching or, or, or what? Hallelujah. I'm trying to be a, a sweet, wonderful man that I am. God loves to perform, not hearers only. And then he said, do you call me Lord? Do you? Do you call me Lord? Yes, I call you Lord. Then why don't you do as I told you? Acts 2.38 is divine order. Then Peter said unto them, okay, what's the command? How do I get saved here today at church? What do I do? Repent. You're telling me to repent? Who do you think you are? It's what the Bible says. Repent and conjunction. Who's doing the repenting? God, God's repenting that he ever made you. No, you got to repent. You got to repent. And conjunction connected tissue, here's the problem, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Is that the book? If you can read English, clap your hands. For the remission of sins, the first two things in divine order is a command and a promise, and man's got to do it. Man's got to respond. And then what happens? God fulfills it at the end. And you shall receive the gift. You shall receive. You shall receive. You shall receive. It works in healing. It works in, it works in salvation. It works in, in plannings. It works in building. It works in everything. Hallelujah. In the unity of the saints and the church of the living God. It's our doing that exacts the supernatural divine performance by God. Repent, baptism now, divine order propels the new birth. Hallelujah, the gift of the Holy Ghost. And captain over the Syrian host was Naaman. Great, powerful Naaman, but he was a leper. What's a leper? The worst of the worst of that era. A literal cancer on the body. Body parts falling off. The most horrible looking disease of the, it's MRSA on the outside. It's vile. It smells. You had to declare yourself as unclean and not let people get near you. I have been in my lifetime to a colony of lepers and prayed. It was not easy for me to have to look right into the nose cavity of people. Eyes fall out, dry up. Horrible, horrible thing. And Naaman was a leper, and he showed up at the prophet's house. What did he go to the prophet's house for? He had sense. I need my healing. I need to find the man of God. He's excited. Now I want you to see the four attitudes, the four attitudes of Naaman that got him, uh, got him out of divine order and finally got him back in it. You can get out of divine order and get back in it, thank God. Can you say praise the Lord? But he goes to the, the preacher's house and he's carrying an attitude, and it's a good one. It is, yeah, I've got this terrible disease, but they've all told me if I get to that preacher, I'm going to get healed, and I'm going, I'm going to get healed, I'm going to get healed, I'm going to get rid of this leprosy today. And he has the spirit of expectation. He's full of faith. He's excited. But once he gets there, after the spirit and attitude of expectation for healing from God and the prophet laying hands on him, he now gets there and the method and the message tick him off. I mean, somebody already could be sitting out here and I don't even know, you're fuming, you're mad at me because I said in Jesus' name or some way you don't like it heard or some way you don't like it taught. Hallelujah. I'm in the book. I'm, I got the microphone and I'm just going to plow. Praise God. I know what the Bible says and I'm preaching the Bible. He goes from great expectation and joy in his face 
to sullen, ugly spirit. You mean to tell me, I, you know who I am? Do you know who I am? I am Naaman, the captain of the Syrian host. And you want me to go to that stinking, smelly river and get dipped seven times? Why couldn't you pick the far, far? Doesn't that sound like a great river? The far, far river. Why couldn't you have picked that river? And anger and resentment began building up. Or, or even the brook Cherith, praise God. But, but wait a minute, Naaman. Let, let's, let's interview you here a second. You were high as you came to the church because you were about to get healed with faith and expectation. You were all high about it. You were full of expectation. You were told to go and get prayed for. And now you have a very bad offended spirit. What's your problem? Oh, well, I'll tell you, my expectation only stays where people do it how I want it done. So if God or life, look at me, folks, if God or life crosses you at any time, God or life or the preacher and it crosses your theology and crosses your expectation, then you are going to quickly jump out of divine order and you are going to be so mad. The Bible says that Naaman was so mad at the prophet of God that he turned around in a rage. He had a servant that said if he'd asked you to do a great thing you'd have done it he just said the Jordan River I've been in the Jordan River I've baptized in the Jordan River it's nasty it's just pure dark mud it's not clear and blue so I get that but when you get out of divine order there's a command there's a promise and then there's God's performance he, ha he was completely stuck on the river far far the river Banna that's not my choice. I don't want Jordan. I don't want Jordan. Let me ask you if you know who got baptized in the Jordan. You're better than Jesus. Jesus got baptized in the Jordan by John, but you're better than Jesus. Hallelujah. Let me know when you want to get baptized, and we'll have a company come out and sterilize the baptismal tank. We'll have it repainted and sanded for you. We'll put your name on the wall. You were baptized that particular day. Folks, that's not what life's all about. That's not what it's all about. It's about getting in divine order. Expectation goes from, from expectation to contempt to malice, to anger, all because it crossed his opinion, all because it crossed his theology and his ego, and God knew the motive the whole time and the attitude of Naaman. Preacher, hey, you're telling me I'm wrong, preacher? I've been going to this church before Brother Gray. I came here before Sister Gray. Well, that's going way back. I'm not wrong, okay? Okay, I'm not here to argue with you. I just want you to know your nose just fell off over there, and you have two fingers that just fell off your left hand, and they're rolling over here, and you need some help, buddy. Praise God. You need a little bit of help. You need to just... Uh... I knew nobody would be shouting today, but this is an attitude thing of expectation and then contempt and anger. And he went from non-compliance to after seeing his fingers rolling around and his nose on the floor and his, his humble spirit of his servant telling him you would have done a great thing if it had been asked of you, he repents. Thank God he repented. And the Bible says that God is willing that all be saved and all come to repentance. And when he repented, praise God. Everybody say repentance. When he repented, it changed everything. It went from command to promise to performance to the miraculous. Dip seven times. Four, four and a half, five. Come on, muddy water. Six, seven. 
and his skin became as a baby's. Nose is back, ears are back, everything's back. Every oh, somebody rejoice. Our God, our God did that in a baptism. What is he now? He's full of praise. He's full of promise. He's full of joy. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. He's full of an attitude of gratitude. He gets in divine order with God, and divine order brings the rewards of a generous God. God loves it when we honor him. God loves it when we honor him with our materialism, with our money, with our worship, with our body, with our praise. He loves divine order in our passion, in, in worshiping God, and what we spend our time on. God loves divine order in all these things. You see, divine order will always bring a harvest, and you want that harvest that comes from God. Anybody got one of the harvest that comes from God for getting in divine order? We're, we're blessed here today. Folks, you don't realize how blessed we are. We are blessed. Somebody say praise the Lord. The fact that you have a harvest today proves that a harvest exists. Did you sleep in a home last night? If you slept in a home last night, that is a harvest. If you slept in an apartment last night and you were able to pay San Diego fees, that is a harvest. If you're able, praise God, to put clothes on today and not be naked, that is a harvest. If you have a job and an income today, that is a harvest. It's a proof of God's harvest. Your husband is a harvest. I said your husband's a harvest. Makes money, takes care of you, pays the bills. Your wife's a harvest. Say praise the Lord. Don't take a harvest for granted. You need to embrace divine order in your home, in your marriage. Good health is a harvest. And health returned by the healing power of the name of Jesus is a harvest. God is good. Clap your hands. <laughs> Divine order makes life better. Divine order makes marriage better. Divine order makes your home better. Divine order makes a church have revival. <laughs> if you have a job and an income, if you have a job and an income, listen to me. Somebody has perceived intellectually that you can do the job for their company and they hired you. What did they hire you to do? To do what they tell you to do, but they're going to stop every week and 52 weeks they're going to cut you a check for the work that you have done because they have confidence in you that you will be a harvest for their company. And there'll be even more checks if you do a good job at Christmas and Easter and, and, and retirement, other blessings. They will give you checks because they perceive you have a distinctive gift to produce. Hallelujah to God. Don't take a harvest for granted. It's a command. It's a promise. And then the performance of God. Give and it shall be given to you. Good measure pressed down. Shake it together and running over shall men give to your bosom as God moves on them. Running over. Shaking together shall give to your bosom divine order. Love is a harvest. How many's ever been in love? Amen. Puppy love is the beginning of a dog's life. I've probably said that a hundred times. Still fun to say? Love is a harvest. Good romance is a harvest. Good looks are a harvest. You could have easily been but ugly. I'm serious. All God had to do is turn your nose up an inch and a half up. 
take your ears and send them straight out of your head and you'll look like a Volkswagen going down the road with the doors open. You could have looked like Porky the Pig. I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings. I don't think anybody's ugly here today. I'm just talking. God, God could have had a sense of humor. We have no idea how close to ugly we all became. Babies are beautiful. They're precious. They're pure. But babies look like a little old bald-headed man. You got to give them a few weeks. Praise God. And, and they become beautiful. And they're a picture of you. God was good to you in the harvest. Turn to somebody and say, you barely got by. No, don't do that. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful that somebody fell in love with you and said, I do? Is that, is that wonderful? That's the best day of my life after salvation. Joni said, I do. I will. I do it all over again. Same woman, a lot earlier. It's wonderful. It's a harvest. I'm preaching the results of divine order. Does anybody understand what I'm saying this morning? God wants to bless and reward everybody hearing me. Open your eyes to the blessing of divine order. When God calls something holy, I don't care what it is in the Bible, and God calls it holy, everybody say holy. holy. That word means more to God than you'll ever know. The word holy means set apart. Now let me, let me free it up. Set apart unto God. That's why everything we do in the church, do it unto the Lord. Don't ever get resentful. You're cleaning the toilet. You're filling an ice box. You're doing something. You're raking up leaves. Don't ever get an attitude. Just do it unto the Lord, and you'll have such joy. And the word holy means set apart. So someone filled with a holy, what is it? Ghost. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I am not... Add in some new doctrine to the Bible, it means you're full of the Holy One of Israel. You're set apart. You, you're no longer, you've had a radical change in your life. You've been baptized in the power of the Holy Ghost. You're sanctified, a holy priesthood, a peculiar nation. You're in a divine order. There was a man a few years ago that was, it was, it was, we just had it uh, Valentine's Day, but it was Valentine's Day, and he went out and bought his wife a, a very extensive, very, very expensive, wildly expensive dress. And he wanted to buy her this dress and spend this extra money and go whole hog on it so she would know how much he loved her. And as the store was wrapping the woman's very expensive dress, the guy just grabbed a note by the cash register. Can I use your pen, ma'am? Thank you. And he scratched out a note, and this is what he wrote on the note in the card. I want you to know you are always on my mind, and I love you. He gave her the dress. She unboxed the dress. She held it up. She looked at it. She turned it sideways. She held it up to herself. She looked in the mirror. Honey, that's lovely. Thank you. That's very nice. And she put it in the closet and hung it up. Because no man can pick a dress for his wife. But then she saw the note. She looked at that note. You are always on my mind she took it to the big vanity mirror in the restroom she taped it to the mirror 
she looks at it every day for a couple of years now because it wasn't the expense of the dress. It was the passion of the love. It was the fact that he thought about her and he wrote about her. And today, God is so into your passion, into your worship, into your praise, into God, when I get up in the morning, I, you are always on my mind. God, when I go to bed at night, you are always on my mind. God, when I go to church this Sunday morning, you are always on my mind. Can somebody just give a little praise and a little love to the Lord? What blesses God is the spirit of obedience. That woman brought the alabaster box. She broke the spike nard. History says she spent one year of income, one year, and poured it out lovingly on Jesus Christ. Head, feet. Jesus was moved and said she'll never be forgotten. A woman who got in divine order. Malachi 3.10. Look what it says. It's a picture of divine release. Blessing. Bring you all the tithes and the stores. I'm not preaching about tithe. I'm preaching about a principle here. Divine order. Look what it says. Say the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour like she poured out on Jesus, pour you out a spike nard, that there shall not be room enough to receive. receive. Prove me means provoke me with your spirit of you are always on my mind. I love you so much. I'm glad to do this. It's a divine release. Provoke means open the floodgate. God said I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Stay with me here for a, a moment. Now I want to just pour it out. Praise God and, and say to everybody here but this church was birthed in Yokohama, Japan. David Gray, David Franklin Gray, Olive Haney Gray were in Yokohama, made in Japan, like my wife said. I want to say something. God had a plan for that elder to get out of Japan to be baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking with tongues, become a one God apostolic preacher. And in 1945, God directed him and his wife, Billy, to this church. And the lower left, the lower left corner of the United States, right at Tijuana, Mexico, God sent a man during wartime and God put him into the pulpit, not only in little tiny groups of people, but the Hour of Power radio, hallelujah. And he founded this church in, the, in 1945 in divine order, and God blessed it, and God used it, and God kept it. I want to say we're not just another Lutheran or Catholic or Baptist church or a local church. I want to tell you this is not just a neighborhood church in the southwest corner of the United States. There have been hundreds of pastors come out of this church and pastors wives and missionaries and missionaries wives and teachers uh, and preachers. Uh, hallelujah. They've been trained here in a church that has divine order and I want to tell you, you look at this church like some little thing in a casual way that I got to go to on Sunday and other people will drive an hour and an hour and a half four or five families will come here to, to be in the house of God in the presence presence of God. They recognize it's not just a neighborhood church. We're connected to worldwide revival. We're connected to worldwide evangelism. You treat it casually. I'm not joking. Ah, it's just a church. 
Do you know why God put this church at 1765 Pentecost Way? Do you know why God put this church at 1765 Pentecost Way? So your family could have a church. So your marriage could have a church. So your backslidden kids could have a church. So your grandkids could have a church. Do you realize God loved you so much he put a church? It's not in a neighborhood. It's here for you. It's here for your house. It's here for your family. It's here for your children. I don't try to shake people over hell and be mean. But I love the truth, and I love people. And if I get in your face, you've had to push me a long ways to, to get in your face. Because I don't do that very often. Some of you might not like what I have to say right now, but i got to hurry, get on a plane, and go to the Philippines. And I just found out information. I'm not trying to spread stuff over the pulpit. I'm just going to have to handle it pastorally. Because I won't have time. Hallelujah. Everybody say, I love Jesus. Jesus. Precious young man made an appointment with me. Did it all right. I need to go somewhere. I need to answer the call to this. Go there. I worked with them. Gave them my blessing. Well done. Guys get together. They get goofy. You going there? Yeah. Well, here come a couple of guys passing through town. I was as nice as I could be to them. I'm pastor now. And as nice as I could be to them, I didn't know because I was told later by the people involved in the situation, they weren't living for God. And these guys that weren't living for God said, if you move to Ohio, we can all go back there, get an apartment. We can flip houses. Man, we'll be millionaires. We'll all share the rent. We'll all pay the bills. Before it's over, you'll be knocking each other out with a hammer. Because some things aren't the right principle. You don't just make plans to leave town and move across the nation because two guys not living for God told you there's a job there for you. And it's less money to live there. Now, don't get puffy fish and don't get Naaman. Back it down and say, yeah, I'm going to slow the whole process down. And when Brother Larson gets back, I'm going to make an appointment with him. Did all the victory go out of this church? God wants to save you from hellfire. You need a job? Man came up to me this week in this church and said, Brother Larson, I am desperately in need of a job. I said, okay, let me make a phone call. I called a good man with a good business and said, I got a guy here who needs a job. He said, I need a guy right now. Send him out. I will hire him right now. You need a job? I got him a job. Who in the world am I tonight? Am I some guy to beat you over the head with a broomstick? No. This is the church of the living God. Get in divine order. The Bible says to preach the word, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and dying. I'm not trying to hurt anybody. I love everybody. But the Bible says, I will give an account for your soul. And you want a good report. And we have some of the best here. It's the blessing of divine order. He said, you shall, I will open up the windows of heaven. You shall not have room. Let me tell you how true the Bible is. Most of you that live in a house, your house is full. Your bedrooms are full. Your bathrooms are full. Your kitchen's full. 
then go out in the garage, your garage's full, and then go in the shed, it's got a lawnmower, and you've got all the mowing stuff, and that's full. Your, your cars are full. Oh, you have more than one car, you have two. Oh, do you drive them at the same time? You drive two at one time. You've got two cars. Some people have three cars. Some people I won't mention have five, six, seven, and eight cars. Hallelujah to God. And I heard the laughter in the audience. Praise God. I want to tell you, I want to tell you, praise God. God has been good. He's opened the windows of heaven. You don't have room for all of your blessings. So where are you going in the next few minutes? Is it on your bucket list to go to Colonel Sanders? Are you waiting for me to shut up so you can get to Colonel Sanders? Let me tell you about Colonel Sanders. He was living in Kentucky on Social Security. Colonel Sanders. An old man with white hair sitting on a park bench feeding pigeons, and he got an idea. My grandmother gave me an old chicken recipe, a special chicken recipe, a secret recipe, and I'm going to start cooking chicken. And he was 70 years old, and he started cooking chicken. And today, you can go in Muslim countries, Christian countries, no countries, any countries, and you're going to find that little white-bearded guy. The colonel is dead. The colonel is dead. Hi-ho, hi-ho. The colonel is dead, but some of you still have it on your bucket list, and you're going to go visit the colonel today. And if Charles Mahaney was here, he never wanted a cheeseburger. He never wanted fruit, nuts, and drinks. He just said, ah, give me a Bucket of chicken, in Jesus' name, hallelujah. I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. I will teach you to be blessed, to be good, to be godly, to be anointed. Judges 5 2 says, The people willingly offered themselves, willingly offered themselves. I guess this was my last sermon for the month. Come on. Come on, get in place. Play something touching. <laughs> my sweet wife and I have knocked doors by the hours built Sunday school routes, built a bus route. We used to knock on these doors and one day we, could, we, would, we passed a pickup with big knobby tires. We knocked on the door, nobody was home and we came back past the pickup and we woke up the German shepherd under that truck. I saw him coming and I grabbed her by the hand and I pulled for all I was worth to get her out of his way. And he came up behind her thigh and bit in and shook it and flipped her down the sidewalk. That was a shaky experience. But another time we knocked on the house and the lady didn't shut the door in time and the pit bull was coming and he was coming fast and hard and I'm getting ready because that's the most precious thing I got but the laugh was on the pit bull he was on a leash and before he got to us oh, pulled him up in the air and yanked him backwards I said, hallelujah. <laughs> I don't know which of the two pictures you like. But if you're not in divine order today, you're going to get bit and you're going to get ripped. But if you get in divine order, the devil comes as a roaring lion seeking to devour you to take your kids, to take your family. And God has a holy leash on him. 
No weapon formed against thee shall prosper. We're singing unto the Lord, and I'm asking the church to respond today. God, you've already talked to me. I want to get in divine order. Let's sing. Let's sing. Let's pray. Let's sing. Let's sing.